All right. In November 2009, Thierry Henry became a persona non grata in Ireland. He wasn't the only one either. Referee Martin Hansen, who was in charge of that game, also wouldn't have been particularly welcome in the country in the days afterwards. Naturally, he had missed the Thierry Henry handball between himself and his linesmen. And there was a documentary being made around that time called Ratsky Paren, um, which is the Swedish title, The Referee. And it's directed by Matthias Love. And he joined me a little bit earlier. Well, the thing, I wanted to do a documentary about a referee to begin with. And Sweden had a few high profile uh, referees like Anders Frisk, uh, who was the referee in the Euro, Euro final 2000 between Italy and, and France. So in the, in the years after that, up to 2007, 2008, I was constantly thinking, should I make a documentary? Shouldn't I? But I needed to find a referee that I felt, and I hate to say this, but I felt could end up in some kind of controversy. And I think during the years from when Martin became a FIFA referee on, there was always some controversy, especially on an international level every year in Champions League or in a FIFA match or something. So I thought that, you know, in order to actually show the social aspects of being a referee, the pressures, the fact that you can't win anything, you can just avoid controversy, made it interesting for me to follow him. And I decided I need to follow him on and off for a year because... That'll be the only chance for me, first of all, to see if he will be picked for the World Cup. And second of all, to see if there is one of these controversies and how it will affect him. Uh, as a bonus from a cynical documentary filmmaker's point of view, he also came on to the documentary right after the divorce. And, uh, and I think that made it a little bit more interesting for me because I had to ask him the ultimate question, obviously, what was more important, the family or being a referee? Because... Referees are also competitive, like players, obviously. Yeah, and um, was he was it hard to persuade him to get involved in the project initially? Not really, no. It, it was just a little hard to persuade him to agree with all the terms because I told him that if we're going to do this, you're going to have to go full in. In case something happens, I'm going to be the one you speak to. So you can't completely lock me out in case something happens. And you need to speak with me openly and freely, and you need to be honest because... Uh, Otherwise, it's not going to work, and I'm going to invest a lot of time in this, and it's not going to fly in the end. So he was a little bit hesitant towards that because he signed a lot of, of course, non-disclosure forms and, and, and things like that with FIFA and UEFA because he was at the point when I made the film, probably at the height of his career, and he was the referee in the final of Confederations Cup that year in, in uh, where was it, in South Africa between US and, and Brazil. So he was probably the top three, top five referees in the world at the time of that match in, in Paris 10 years ago. Yeah. So it, it, was, it was not that difficult to persuade him because, you know, everyone is a bit narcissistic and having a documentary made about you, it's... Few people would say no to that, really. Yeah. Um, as he said in the documentary, football takes over your life completely. So family um, and other, you know, even his work as a firefighter kind of falls a little bit by the wayside in comparison. But were you surprised by some of the, I suppose, not so much the pressures, but some of the, uh, I suppose, the tasks and things that were involved maybe that we don't think about in terms of referees? Because we always think about just the what happens on match day. But there is a lot of preparation that happens before, both physical and mental. Well, being a referee is almost the same as being a professional football player right? in terms of preparation. You need to train every day, sometimes several times a day. Mentally, you need to be in complete harmony and balance. Uh, you need to be the one that keeps a, a very steady calm on the pitch, obviously. But you need to run almost as much, if not more, than the players. So I was quite impressed about his dedication because at the time he was a referee. I think he was around this... He was around 39, 40 at the time. So he was about at least 10 years older than most players. And he had more or less the same physique than most players. Uh, so all that dedication, but also all these other things, the preparation mentally and everything. I was quite impressed following him to see all that. But it wasn't really my aim for the documentary to follow, to see how much work you had to put in. I was more interested in how you got affected on a social level when you ended up in controversy and then you, how you manage to juggle and balance things in life with children, with family. And in Martin's case, he's, he's running a whole farm, you know, with, with a lot of, you know, forest and not animals, but with a lot of, lot of things to take care of. So I was quite impressed. And at the time when I started, he was still a firefighter full time. He got, he got a full time position with the Swedish Football Association as a referee during that year. So 
to see that transition was also interesting, and he managed it very well. Uh, especially up to that day in Paris, of course. Yeah, that day. We'll, we'll get on to that day very shortly. But he already had to deal with abuse in Sweden anyway, and it's natural for a referee to always be the target. It doesn't matter which side it is. Um, the referee is always the, the least uh, popular person, really, on the pitch. So how did he deal with the abuse, and especially the media interest? Because even, as you said, he lived in an isolated farm, but yet people would turn up looking for him. I think I think in Sweden the the the, the Swedish league is, is not a very good one, but it has passionate supporters and especially the teams from the big cities Stockholm and Gothenburg, and I think Martin early on in his career didn't do very well in those games from their point of view. He ended up in a lot of controversy with the teams from the big cities, and because he also was from a small city in the south, uh, I think it became natural for the supporters of these teams to always shout his name in a very condescending and derogatory way because he ended up in those situations. And I think that translated a little bit later on to the British teams that he refereed in Champions League because it seemed like he always ended up in some kind of controversy in Champions League and in international matches, matches with British teams. And I think, I think you know, going against a Stockholm team or a British team is the worst thing you can do in, in football from a Swedish context or from a world context because the British are very passionate. You know, they're not necessarily very good teams, but they're very passionate about their football. Yeah. And and the same thing with, with the Stockholm teams. You know, they traditionally this year they did tremendously well in the league, but normally they're, they're jo joing up between the first division and the premiership and, you know, they haven't really won a lot, but now they've started to actually do well as well. But at the time when Matti was a referee and at his prime, the, the Stockholm teams weren't doing very well. So the, the supporters were looking for a scapegoat, someone to blame. And Matti became that. That's why I wanted to start a documentary with that condescending singing towards him being this and that. And to show a little bit the type of environment that this man was working in. You know, it's, it, it's, it must be horrendous to come in to hear these things sang in your ears before much even start. Yeah, and obviously there's a there's a scene in it as well where you're all in a corridor and there's a few people from the press, including Afton Bladet as well, and uh, Martin already kind of has his back up and they're trying to um, you know they're trying to maybe get a quote from him, but he's already he already has a bad relationship with the media at this point as well, and just feels like he's going to be misquoted. I think that was also one part that we spoke about a lot, and I was hoping for that situation to occur because especially the tabloids. I mean, they're not the sun type of tabloids in Sweden, but but they're still tabloids in the sense of sport journalists and um, the evening papers, so-called. They're not evening anymore. They come out in the mornings. But these papers, they're obviously misquoting a lot of things that is being said, and they're always putting it in an angle that they like. And, and I told Martin, because he is usually very diplomatic, but I told him, here is your chance to say what you really feel about these guys and what they are actually doing when they write articles after asking you these questions and changing and misquoting you. So tell them really what you feel from the inside, because Martin wouldn't normally be that frank and that direct. Normally he would be a little bit more diplomatic and kind, and he is somewhat diplomatic and kind in his responses, but he's also very direct, and he says that, you know, your type of journalism, I can't stand it, it's on a horrible level, and I'm always getting misquoted, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that was a little bit his... Uh, Redemption, I don't know. It was a little bit his, his opportunity to give back for many, many years of uh, journalistic assault. Yeah, on him. Uh, yeah, which uh, brings us nicely to November 2009. So, of course, Ireland are trailing 1-0 um, from the first leg. They've taken the lead in Paris. Martin's having a good game initially at this point, and then the mistake happens where he doesn't spot Thierry Henry as handball the ball more than once and led to France's goal, um, which we're obviously still talking about 10 years on. But um, do you remember where you were um, when, uh, or when you were at least told when he, that he had made a mistake of this magnitude? Well, the thing is, first of all, these matches they don't they don't pick the referees till very close before the game, you know, because these were playoff matches and they were played within what, four or five days between each other, so they weren't picking the referee very fast, which meant that I didn't have time to apply for an accreditation and get it on time. So I wasn't in Paris myself, filming him. But I told Martin when he got this game, because it was just a few days before the game, uh, 
because he had heard one week or one and a half week before that he was going to get a playoff match, probably. But he heard a few days before you said he was going to get game. So I told him, in case something happens, you need to contact me as soon as possible after the game. So I was at home in Stockholm at the time. And I wasn't really watching the game. I was doing something else, um, which may sound a little bit strange. But I was doing something else. But then my wife, she, she told me that something happened in this football game in Paris. Wasn't that where your, where your referee was, was uh, wasn't there where, where the, your referee was refing and did the game in Paris. I said, yeah, what happened? And then she, she told me that she just heard that there was a handball that decided the game and the Irish, Irish went out and the French, the France team went to the World Cup. So I turned on the news and I saw all that and I just understood that this is it. This is the controversy. This is unfortunately what the film is going to lead up to. And I was just waiting for Martin's call and he called me the next day and it was quite a, a sober approach to what happened. And he explained to me that he hadn't spoken to anyone and uh, he had to protect his family because since the Irish were involved, he had experiences with the, with British teams before that had, had been in controversies and journalists and fans coming up to his farm and, you know, harassing his family, mother, father, kids, everything. So he went away for a week, but he called me on the, on the day after the game and, and, uh, one part that I didn't use in the film was that he almost broke down into tears because he's so fond of Ireland. He loves the Irish people and he loved Ireland. And he said, it could have been any team in the world, but why Ireland, you know, my favorite country. And I couldn't use that because it would have been too biased to use that in the film. Yeah. But it was a very, very sad part because he, I knew that he always spoke so fondly about all these times he had spent in Ireland when he had been traveling there with his family and as a tourist. So I just felt so much with him at that moment. Uh, but like I said, I couldn't use that in the film because it would have been a little strange in that context. I had to be very clear about how he felt and how FIFA had told him to be in the position he were and he couldn't see the handball. And when you look at the replays, the only obvious referee or assistant referee that should have made that call would have been the, the linesman that were on the side that should have seen the handball because it, it was his call. If Martin was told by FIFA to be in that position, I think he didn't do anything wrong. It was the assistant referee who missed the handball. Yeah. And I think that is also the reason why FIFA was actually picking him for the World Cup. They took responsibility. They took responsibility indirectly for, for telling him where to be in that situation. Yeah, and in terms of, obviously, as you said, he broke down in tears when he was speaking to you, but in terms of his state of mind over a period of maybe the weeks and months, obviously, because he does reappear in the documentary later, um, how down was he and how, and in your, from what you could kind of gauge, how badly affected was he? I think he knew that was the end of his career, really, internationally. Even if he got picked, of course, he had the challenge of doing the, the this running test before he, he officially got picked to, to the World Cup in South Africa 2010. But I think he knew inside, and he said that as well, that he will be remembered for this mistake or whatever you call it. He'll be remembered for that. And I think from there on, from that night in Paris, I think it was a downhill slope for him. Because after the World Cup, where he obviously didn't ref any games, he was just a fourth referee in four or five games, he ended up just being a referee in the Swedish league and then he slowly faded away and he went back and now he's working as a, as a, as a firefighter again in the same city he worked before I started to make the film. So I think inside himself, he knew that that was, that mistake was too decisive to just brush over. And I think he felt inside that that is probably, that was the end of his, of his international career and maybe also the end spiritually uh, for himself as a referee, even though he didn't do a mistake officially from a FIFA uh, rule book type of perspective. I think he felt that he knew he was going to be judged by that mistake the rest of his life. Yeah, and like you worked closely with him for that period of time making the documentary. Have you kept in touch with him in the, in the years since? No, we haven't. We've run into each other a few times, but not planned. Uh, I think he was quite disappointed with me focusing the documentary very much on this night in Paris. But I told him beforehand that if something happens, there will be a large part of that to focus on in the documentary because the dramaturgy 
of the film, the structure of the film will obviously run up towards that. So we were very clear on the fact that he needs to make no controversies then if we're going to avoid that and focus just on the social aspect. Now, of course, when you make a mistake in a decisive playoff game for the World Cup that decides which teams are going and which isn't going, I mean, if I... I'm not a journalist per se, but if I wouldn't use that as my main story line, so to say, in the film, when I do a film about a high-pressure job like a football referee on top level in the world, it, it wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't be the same type of film. It wouldn't be a film that people would be really interested in. I was just somewhat lucky to follow him in a year that decides so much in his life as a referee. And I can understand that he was a bit disappointed. There was a lot of focus on that, but... I think the disappointment was mainly on himself, not so much on the film. But we, we haven't really kept in touch on a on a personal level. But because I also try to always keep a distance to my subjects in my documentaries, I don't want to get too close. So yeah. so maybe part of it is, is is my outlook. Yeah, I suppose a final question before I let you go. Um, I'm always curious as to why anybody would want to be a referee in the first place. And it's one of those existential questions. Um, did you get close at all to finding out that answer, why anybody would decide to put themselves through that domain? Because it's, uh, it's, not, a forgiving, it's not a forgiving role for anybody. I think my, my only answer to that, because it's difficult to say, since these are very subjective personal reasons, but my... My feeling is that these people, they really like to be there in the eye of the storm, the referees on that level that I have met, and they couldn't really cut it as players themselves, but they got the taste. They got the taste in the mouth of being there in the middle of the storm and, you know, being seen, being known, you know, being in the middle of all this, how should I say, attractive drama, action, that a football game, an international football game with all the emotions uh, an impact it has. I, I would say it, it, it is, they couldn't make it as players, but they still wanted to cling on to that feeling. And and this was their chance, you know, so they became referees instead. Well, that's as close an answer as we'll ever get. <laughs> Certainly, I'm not signing up to ever referee a match or get involved at that level at all. I don't think we'll deal with the amount of hate. But the documentary is fascinating. And for anybody who does want to look for it, it's the referee, Ratsky Paren, if you're looking for the Swedish name. Um, I hope I've pronounced that OK, Matthias, because <laughs> Swedish is not one kind of my of. languages. <laughs> um, but anyway, thanks, no, a million, just... thanks a million for joining us. Matthias Lowe, director of Ratsky Paren, um, the referee. Thank you.